So welcome to this breakout session. I hope you've enjoyed all of the great stuff you've been hearing today. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Tom. I'm a data scientist at Kaveya. I've been here for about three years and um, I am looking at the moment how we can help protect our business and our customers by protecting ourselves against insurance fraud amongst many things but this is my main project at the moment so I'm really excited that I've got the opportunity um, to come and talk to you about it today. So in this short session I'll cover a little bit about the insurance market that we operate in just to give some context of, of really why fraud occurs and then a bit about what fraud means in our industry, what we can do about it and how COVID has impacted things. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So to give a bit of context about our insurance industry, um, it's important that we, that we take some key facts. So um, the data I've got here is, is by no means the most uh, to the pound accurate, but it does give us a clear picture. So the UK insurance market is, is the fourth largest in the world and is certainly um, the largest in Europe. Um, we've got about 170 billion in premiums across life and non-life products in 2017. And we are a net exporter of pension and insurance products. And a bit about us. So in 2019, Covey had 2.1 million policyholders and about 800 million uh, in premiums. And the reason I wanted to, to start with this is to give you, it's a big industry. Um, and it's also an industry with a lot of public participation. I mean, most of us have, uh, have interacted with an insurance company in some form or another. And most importantly, the more people you have involved in a market, the, more, the, the higher the chance that there could be some dishonest or fraudulent behavior. So to further build up a bit of context, um, I did some research um, again through the uh, uh, Association of British Insurers, which we're a member of, and they do represent about 200 insurers. So I know this is really accurate, uh, accurate data. Some, some key things stood out for me. Last year, insurance, uncovered, insurance companies uncovered 1.2 billion pounds uh, worth of fraud, which is a huge sum of money. And most interestingly, out of some of the stats you can see here, that every five minutes, some form of insurance fraud case is uncovered. That's about 300 times a day. So I really want to just make it clear that fraud is a constant factor in, in, in our business and not just isolated to us, but all insurers serving all products will experience this. To try and make it clear about what fraud really means, I came up with this rather silly analogy, but I hope you'll see that it works. Um, fraud comes in a number of different disguises. And one analogy I came up with is a bit of a, like an eye test. So for those like me who need glasses, um, you're presented with your many letters on a wall and they start right at the bottom and are really small and tiny and you can't quite make out what they are. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger until it's really obvious what you're looking at. Fraud, I think, is quite similar. Fraud can start really, really small. So, for example, you apply for an insurance quote and you're presented with a list of job titles. Sometimes you can never find the exact one you're looking for. I know the data scientist isn't always available as a particular job role. So you have to scoot around and try and find what your role might be. Then fraud can potentially get a little bit more serious, might be policy manipulation. So maybe I don't really keep my car on a private driveway, as I said in my in my quote. It can get bigger still. Let's say there was an accident and I said there was actually five people in the car as opposed to four. It can get even bigger than that. Fake identities. We can Entire policies can be bought on a pure fake identity or a stolen identity, which means that you might be getting a premium on a much lower rate. That person may then go on and, and add lots of very high risk drivers, or it could be a completely fictitious claim. A crash, for example, never happened. So just like trying to find the right lens for your, your glasses prescription, fraud can be hidden. It is not obvious all of the time. If it were, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today, but it's all some form of fraud and it certainly isn't a victimless crime. And that's really important to point out. So that's why insurers do invest millions a year 
in trying to track and understand where fraud comes in and nobody wins out of fraud customers don't win and neither do we so we have to spend a lot of time and thought in trying to understand fraud but the main point of this slide is that it's not always obvious and it comes in many different shapes and sizes so what can we do about fraud well this is where data science can come to help so at the risk of overusing my um, going to the opticians analogy, but I still think it makes the point quite clear. The most simple data science is about mapping one entity to another. In this case, we look at data about a claim. So for example, your policy excess, when the accident occurred, was the police involvement, and we try and identify a fraudulent behavior from that. So we take on one side to the other. So on the left-hand side, you can see we've got lots of data about claims, again, in my rather terrible analogy. On the right-hand side, we can see we've identified some fraud. That's what data science helps to achieve. We map one item, to another. But there are many different ways that we can do this. We use machine learning primarily, but most important about that is that we can use historic data, trends in data yeah, using millions of, of our records and also external data to identify patterns which aren't obvious to the human eye. So I couldn't necessarily identify that our fraud is there or there's a hint of fraud over there, but by using machine learning, for example, like using neural networks, so that's literally using how the brain operates to identify fraud, we can uh, deeply assess every nuance of a claim to help us understand if there is any evidence of fraud. This really isn't easy though, because if you think about it, we can't be too sensitive to fraud, nor can we be too lax. If we were too sensitive, we'd think everything is fraudulent and, no, and there'd be no business movement at all. But equally, if we were too lax, there could be a wide variety of scrupulous claims that we end up paying for and ultimately the customer loses out with as well. So we need to strike a balance. So data science allows us to make sense of the data. We collect and keep lots of interesting records about how claims have affected what happens in a particular claim, what was the outcome, and we use those patterns to predict and infer what future claims. The point is that we build up this knowledge graph almost of historical data patterns that have occurred to try and predict what may happen with future claims. So patterns are really, really important here. And what we try and do with those patterns is deliver that fraudulent analysis directly to our users and into our systems. So we can almost in real time be able to see when a claim might be fraudulent, whether we need to act upon it, and our users can see really clearly whether some attention needed to be given to a particular case. Speaking of patterns, um, fraud tends to follow patterns quite closely or at least we, we believe it does. And to give you an example of some interesting patterns that have occurred, let's look back to 2008. Uh, the financial crash or the credit crunch, I think as we probably mostly knew it as, um, people's finances were being squeezed. So job losses were occurring. And in fact, referring back to the Association of British Insurers, we saw a 30% increase in fraudulent claim activity after the 2008 crisis across product lines. So we could see that there was almost some direct causality. People were pressured more, which led to increased fraudulent activity. Now let's put this into context to 2020, the coronavirus. I don't need to go into any detail about how that's affected our lives, but there is something in common between what's happening today and what we've seen in the past. People now are more financially pressured probably now than they've ever been. Think of this. The furlough scheme ends this Saturday. Many mortgage and car loan holidays that we may have had to take out over, over the main lockdown are probably coming to an end now. And our jobs potentially in some, some sectors are probably less secure than ever. So all of a sudden it starts to become clear, perhaps adding that extra passenger to the car accident that occurred so you can get a little bit more of an extra whiplash claim might actually get you through this month. The point here is that not everyone is making fraudulent, potentially fraudulent activity because we're all hardened criminals, but it could be just through pure desperation. COVID is taking financial hardship to the next level, levels that I don't think I've certainly never seen in my lifetime. 
So when I was thinking about writing this talk, I was scavenging through data and trying to find some really obvious trends to say, ah, oh, that's how COVID has impacted us. But I've discovered that actually it's really hard to do, partly because this is happening right now. Trends often rely on there being a significant amount of time of data to repeat so we can see a pattern. But I can't tell you exactly how coronavirus impacts our business, apart from we know that it does. So the point of this talk is that fraud and data science are inextricably linked. We can use these techniques and it's more valuable than ever because we can are, we are able to pick up patterns faster than we, we used to be able to before. Because as I said, we can analyze every nuance of claims. We can collect trends and build up knowledge graphs of things that are occurring. Data scientists, claims assessors, and the fraud team are really all at the front line of this. And we are trying to find new ways to be quicker and more adept at combating fraud. So the main takeaways for me are, First of all, data science is an exciting and really interesting area to work in. And I've learned so much about a very key area in our industry that I didn't know about before by having to look into the data and trying to examine trends. And I've learned that things are much more reactive than you believe that they are. Trends move fast. New ways to, to identify fraud come about. New ways to exploit fraud come about. But data science is a really exciting area to try and combat those. And we do all sorts of great things to do to achieve that. We regularly look to the latest academic literature. We work with our stakeholders really closely, trying to understand what their personal experiences of how they've captured fraud in the past, to try and build this composite system of both pure mathematical ability to produce a model, but also looking historically at what our users have seen in the past. So hopefully you can see from this very short presentation that fraud is, a, is a, a strange but fascinating place to work in and I'm really excited to see what we can do and we're continuing to do in the future to combat it. Um, so if you have any questions feel free. Hi Tom, sorry, I was going to type, but I haven't. Um, okay. <laughs> how far advanced do you think machine learning is in detecting fraud? And do you see a point where it could, could eradicate it, especially with online claiming? I think the answer to that question lies in how much data we can capture. Historically, I mean, so for example, on this project, where we've made great successes is where we've combined different data sets together. The more we do things online, yes, the more data we can collect about certain cases. I think we'll be in a situation in the future where everything will move much faster. People will find new ways to exploit with financial crime, but the machine learning will catch up quicker and quicker and quicker. What we see now is that it, across the industry, it might take us quite a while to latch on to a new trend. So I don't think I don't think we'll be able to completely eradicate you know, fraudulent behaviour in the industry, but I think we'll be able to become far quicker at detecting it. The more advanced methods we use, the more creative we can be in pattern finding. So it's an interesting question. I think we'll be much quicker at detecting it, um, but I also think the industry will speed up at trying to com uh, at trying to attack us as well. Thank you. Tom, there are some questions coming through in the chat bar. Uh, I don't know if you want to pick those up or if you want me to read them out. Sure. Um, do, you want, do you want to read them out so everyone can hear it nice and clearly? That's fine. Um, so James has asked, where do you see the most interesting opportunities for us in the short term? I think in the short term, we need to, what we've got is a great skill set inside our business of people that really know this industry. And what I was thinking about, and as we've gone through in this project, it's not just about, as as, a, as you as I've said in the in the presentation, data is really important, but it's not just about what the data tells; it's about what people tell us. I probably had some of the most fascinating, some of the trends that I picked out were from people, you know, in our financial crime team, who just know this; they have a gut instinct about things. And I thought that was really interesting because how do you translate a gut instinct 
into maybe capturing that so we can apply that gut instinct in a systematic and much faster way and with a wider selection of claims than we can now and really combine the human knowledge it sounds a bit cyborg but human knowledge with machine learning so i think the quickest one we could have today is i believe using a technique called reinforcement learning so while we don't just learn off trends of data but we also take into account what users have thought so we try and capture their gut instinct and you can do that by let's say that we we make a decision on a claim uh, with a system or advise on a decision we take their feedback directly and feed it back into the machine learning model so that way it's not just learning from data but it's learning from human behavior as well i think we can make some big grounds um, in that in a relatively short space of time great thanks tom um, we've got another question from James. What kind of machine learning algorithms do you use to predict fraud? It's not just one. Uh, it can be quite a number of ones. Um, I'm really interested in, in trying to push the boat out academically and use some of the slightly more novel ones. But in particular, we've seen great successes using, genu um, sorry, using gradient boosting models. Um, your networks have shown great promise as well. We use a multitude of supervised and unsupervised algorithms, which just means, depending on how much you know about them, whether they rely on existing labeled data or to look at patterns more generically. Um, I think for me, the most promising area I'd like to investigate more is using neural networks. OK, next question. Um, what are the risks that we need to consider in using data science in this space? Like anything, if you place a lot of trust in a system, you have to be careful about how it performs. So I think one of the things that we think about all the time, well, there are two main things. One is the ethics behind what we're doing and one's how we can have continual confidence that that piece of machine code, which is really what it is, it might be quite a complicated one, but it's doing what it does. So ethically, we have to be careful. We can't make grand assumptions about swathes of demographics. The trouble is sometimes one of the pitfalls of machine learning, learning is it won't necessarily have the context of why we made the decisions that we made. So for example, we can't just complete, we can't say that one particular area is guaranteed any claim from that area will be fraudulent. That's not true. So we have to ethically think very carefully and put put measures in place to make sure a machine learning algorithm can't run wild with itself and make unfair assumptions about certain groups of people or backgrounds. And then secondly, the monitoring side of things. As soon as you put a machine learning model live, depending on how you architect it, either the model can continually change or the environment around it will continually change. One or both of those will be true. So we have to be really careful that as time goes on, that the predictions that that model makes don't veer too much off what we want it to do. And then additionally, that the model doesn't start to, again, retrain itself through more scrupulous patterns. So it's, it's a very difficult. In fact, it's one of the hardest part of machine learning, the explainability of why that model did what it did and ensuring that we don't unfairly discriminate against other groups. So it's a, it's a you take the science completely out of it. It's a very difficult challenge, if anything, to, for people to trust what machine learning does. But that's where we have to build very sophisticated metrics around what we do. Thanks, Tom. I'm just wondering about kind of bias in data sets and how you know you, you feel we could tackle you know that as a potential risk. I don't know. You've touched on it a little bit there, but is there anything more you could add in? So when I mean, we look at we look at the distribution of data, we can look at it at a very mechanical level. So when tackling um, the motor claims project, you know, we looked as a team, we looked at the data set and tried to understand what the distribution of certain variables were. Some were weighted right the way to one side, some to the other, some were quite an even distribution. So the things you can do, and in fact, we made decisions on certain variables depending on their, how they were distributed. But the bigger picture, it's really difficult because it's not really a mechanical scientific problem. It's, well, how far do we want to go with this? How far we can tune models, for example, to be 
perhaps a bit more sensitive versus more specific. So I said earlier about how um, we have to be careful around do we let all fraud through or do we block all fraud? So it's a mixture of fine mechanical tuning, ethical considerations, and really what the data underlying and how that's based, the data underneath essentially.